Shalom, Shalom. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. I'm delighted to hear that you are drawn to the Jewish root that supports the grafted in branches. You know, Torah is central to properly understand and perform the will of Hashem, that is, God. It is crucial for us to understand theologically that the primary purpose in Hashem's giving of the Torah as a way of making someone forensically righteous only achieves its goal when the person by faith accepts that Yeshua, Jesus, is the promised Messiah spoken about therein. Welcome to Parashat Ekev, because the reading address is Devarim, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 12, through chapter 11, verse 25. The date is for Shabbat, and I'm the author, Torah teacher Ariel ben Lyman. The written commentary was updated on July 3rd of 2006. Note that all quotations are taken from the complete Jewish Bible translation, by David H. Stern, Jewish New Testament Publications Incorporated, unless otherwise noted. Let us begin with the opening blessing for the Torah. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bacha Banu Mikol HaAmim Venatan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Atah Adonai Noten HaTorah Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the Universe. You have selected us from among all the peoples and have given us your Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. I, um, I, before I get started with my commentary, I want to make you um, listeners aware of, um, of a set of commentaries that I'm about to release uh, as soon as I can clear up some of the, uh, the, the post-production details. Um, that will be a series of lectures, uh, classes, or, or studies that I did on the book of Galatians, and the information is going to span um, 28 weeks of a class that I taught live, an hour long each session, um, and we taught, we went systematically through the book of Galatians. It mirrors the written commentary that's available on the web known as Exegeting Galatians. I highly recommend that you go and pick up the work and read through it. The information that's contained in the document, uh, Exegeting Galatians, is um, it's really central to understanding most, if not all, of Paul's letters, and to be sure, it becomes a central theme uh, for under or a central, uh, uh, yeah, a central theme for understanding the social setting and the difficulties that were raised in that setting between the early first century Judaisms and the early emerging non-Jewish communities. That is to say, the the emerging Christian church. Exegeting Galatians is, it will prove to be um, a background, I should say, to help anyone, Messianic or otherwise, uh, to begin to to begin to grasp the challenges that are facing the current Messianic movement today. To be sure, the Messianic movement is facing a crisis, and the crisis involves identity. What should be a proper approach? to Gentiles wishing to keep Torah, what should be a proper approach for Gentiles wishing to become full-fledged covenant members within existing Israel, um, what should we do with the Gentiles it would, would become a standard Jewish question. The reason I mention all of this information is because um, along with the Galatians notes, um, there will soon be a commentary uh, available on the web, I believe. Uh, again, I've got to work all the post-production details, where to put the files, uh, if there will be um, written notes that will follow along with it and how, how you'll get access to them and such. Uh, a commentary that I also did on Tim Haig's excellent short book called Fellow Heirs, Jews and Gentiles in the Family of God. And again, the, sim the information mirrors one another, the Galatians information as well as um, Haig's book. They work together, they work in tandem, so to study them um, 
independently of one another, you're going to find out that the information is very uh, uh, similar to each other. Why am I mentioning these details to you before the beginning of Parashat Ekev? Because here in Parashat Ekev, I'm going to give you basically, in a nutshell, the context for understanding some of Paul's letters, particularly the book of Galatians. And um, the book that Tim Hegg wrote is going to um, find... So it, I'm actually pulling a quote in my commentary here on page... Uh, where is it? Uh, here it is on, on page 4. A significant quote from another one of Hegg's books known as The Letter Writer. Paul's, Paul the Letter Writer. Um, the information that, that we're talking about is is information or is, is our details that in my experience with working in and around messianic communities that would include Jews and Gentiles uh, Christians who have coming who have who have recently maybe come into the messianic movement as well as Jewish people who embraced the Messiah and have been in the movement um, maybe from the beginning there is again a conflict that is arising within recent messianic circles recent as of the recording of this podcast which is um, in July of 2007 and this information that I'm going to share in the in the uh, in my commentary here to Pasha the Kev is going to be a peek at the uh, uh, helping us to solve some of the uh, problems or come up with some better answers um, between the two communities again it's a social situation that faces Jews and Gentiles, and so I want you to listen up very carefully today, especially if you are interested in helping to come to um, some healing between the two communities. Now, at this point, I'm going to call it the greater community, uh, the Messianic community, the Torah community, Jews and Christians who have both embraced Yeshua, um, and even larger than that, we could say the church and the synagogue. Because loosely, pl loosely put, we are one giant community. Um, Christianity, of course, was birthed out of Judaism, one of the sects of Judaism in the first century. And uh, coming from that cradle, Christianity has inherited many of the traits of Judaism, such as a few um, parashot ago. Uh, no, maybe it was just last parasha. We talked about the monotheism and the belief in one God. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. Both groups, both Christians and Jews, affirm the oneness of God. There is no other God worthy of worship except the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so we start from some common understandings of who God is. But things quickly deteriorate from there. And what I want to talk about today, and again what I've talked about in my Galatians commentary and the um, class that's going to be posted to the website as soon as I can get the details worked out, as well as the class that I taught on fellow heirs. Um, both of those uh, studies are going to deal with the social situation that was present in the first century, and it seems to be creeping up again in today's 21st century. And I can tell you what, if we fail to understand what took place in the first century, both with the problems and the solutions, then I can promise you that we're going to misunderstand the problems of the 21st century facing these two communities again, and to be sure, we'll misunderstand the solution. Okay, with that introduction, let's turn to my commentary. It's a short commentary today. It's only six pages long. I'll probably make it one part if I can, maybe like a 45 minute or maybe an hour long uh, one part if you'll allow me okay our portion this week centers on the direct consequences of maintaining an obedient covenant walk within the framework of the Torah of Hashem the first statement in my commentary alone poses a challenge to the standard Christian church why because standard Christian theology or the the, the prevailing Christian view of today of the Torah of Moses, it's no secret, so what I'm about to say is well known, especially in Messianic circles, but it's, it, it, it's well known in Christian circles, it's just not articulated the same way. The Torah of Moses is no longer relevant for our lives. This is a standard Christian teaching um, that you're going to find from church to church. Obviously by now, those of you listening to my podcasts probably don't share this view. You probably by now have figured out that the history surrounding the birth and organization of the first century church to include 
the second, third, fourth centuries and such, when it came to dismissing the Torah, many of you listening to my podcast have discovered that the information on dismissing the Torah does not square with what the Torah and the apostolic scriptures teach about the covenant made with Israel and with uh, Moses. To be sure, many of you listening to my commentaries, reading my uh, uh, teachings, have embraced the Torah of Moshe as a lifestyle. And so, far from bring, it being irrelevant for your lives, it becomes a very, very valuable resource for everyday living. Now, if it's a resource for everyday living, then you, when you read the Torah portions, and I hope you're reading them, you're not going to dismiss the things that God has to say to Israel because you have already concluded the truth is that you've been grafted into Israel even if you're a Gentile believer. It doesn't matter what your family group clan or your family uh, upbringing was, where you came from. You have been grafted into Israel and as Israel's um, as Israel's offspring, you know, the man named Israel, as offspring of Israel, sons of Jacob, the Torah is your heritage. I say to that, Baruch Hashem, I'm so glad, I say this in the opening uh, intro, that I'm pleased that you have um, come to embrace uh, the Torah of Moshe, of Moshe as well as um, you become interested in the Jewish root that supports the grafted in the branches. That's, of course, taken from Romans chapter 11. In our Torah portion here today, God speaks to Israel. Now, even though it's historic Israel when we didn't have a lot of Gentiles, that doesn't make any difference. The paradigm has already been set by the mixed multitude that came out of Egypt. The paradigm, of course, is a picture of salvation. God does not just extend its salvation and deliverance to the offspring of Jacob, the sons of Israel. No, he extended his salvation to anyone who would place their trust in in the shed blood of the Lamb. Now, of course, the physical Lamb was the one whose blood was smeared on the doorposts as they left Egypt. But the picture points forward to the ultimate Lamb who has shed, who has shed his blood, the Lamb of God, Yeshua the Messiah. So, the paradigm that, that Israel is a family clan comprised of Jews and Gentiles is seen in these Torah portions. The immediate context of the passage, Parashat Tekev, here in chapter 7, is Am Yisrael, the people of Israel. And, of course, they're soon to be occupying the land of promise. God said he's going to give them a land, and he is going to make good on their promise if they will just have faith in him and not make the mistakes that their parents did. Over and over, Moshe, in the Torah, establishes the absolute necessity to walk in obedience to the ways of Hashem, that their lives might be abundant as they live in the land that Hashem has sworn to their ancestors. Over and over, God emphasizes, Moshe, you've got to instruct my people. They need to live according to my ways. If I am to bless them, and they are to be the recipients of the righteousness that has been promised to them through the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, then they must walk into my ways, because, I, 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 I'm, of course, paraphrasing the things that God would say, I don't bless wickedness, God says. I don't bless wickedness. And that's a principle that we need to understand as we study the Bible, from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. God does not bless unrighteousness. God does not bless wickedness. Now, God forgives um, uh, disobedience. That's different. If you genuinely try to live after God's ways and you fail and you confess your sins, then the Bible promises that, that he is faithful and that he, is, that he will forgive you. However, blatant disregard for God's words and God's ways, a rejection of God himself, warrants God's punishment. And that's why the Torah of Hashem is an important document for the life of a believer, because we don't want to fall into the place where we have grown cold towards God, and which you know, results in growing cold towards his ways. So Moshe tells the people of Israel, he warns them, and even though they've been redeemed from Egypt, there's no promise that they are going to automatically, corporately, walk into God's righteousness. They must rely on God's Spirit. It's no different then than it is today. It's no different back then, I should say, than it is today. Reliance upon God's Spirit is the only way that you and me can expect to live pleasing to God. The issue, then as we're reading and studying today, must be made clear that covenant promise 
as it relates to blessing, as it relates to maintenance, and as it result, uh, relates to enjoyment of promise is what is in view here, okay? Salvifically speaking, related to salvation, the Torah of Moshe does not uh, grant any, any, um, any uh, benefit, I should say. Salvifically speaking, or to use Paul's words, God offers a righteousness that has nothing to do with the law of Moses. In other words, faith in God's Son is the beginning of a right relationship with God. Salvifically speaking, related to salvation, we must trust God and believe that, that God raised His Son from the dead, believe that His Son paid the price that we couldn't pay. We must avail ourselves of this free gift. We must allow the Spirit to come into our hearts, regenerating our mind, renewing us from the inside. Only at this level can we expect to um, enter into a relationship with God and be poised where we can obey God's words. Beyond that, it's going to be a fruitless attempt. If you try to keep the Torah of Moshe without being regenerated on the inside, you'll only get so far. Ultimately, your Torah obedience will be self-serving. Ultimately, you will continue to fail God time and time again. God designed His words, His ways and His words to be walked out under the Spirit that He freely offers through the gift of His Son. So, if we read the words here in Parashat Kev, and we start reading about the blessings and the curses, there is a natural... A consequence to keeping God's words and God's ways and a natural consequence to failing. Spiritually speaking, it amounts to, um, uh, well, dare I say it, spiritually speaking, if you reject God, God has no choice but to to kill you, <laughs> to condemn you, to, cur uh, to curse you, ultimately. Uh, in other words, you'll find no place inside of His covenant if you reject Him, and ultimately you will be destroyed. It's it, and, the, and the Torah spells, spells that out. But as we read the pages here, we must understand that God speaks to covenant keepers and God speaks to those who are not inside of his covenant. Many people who, who are part of a group are fooling themselves. Many people who are part of the group are actually, uh, they're deceived. They think they belong, but they really don't. God is aware of that. His spirit knows that. And so Moshe writes with this understanding at hand. Safeguarding and keeping God's precious laws were never meant to bring about the physical blessing of covenant shareholder, which of course is a symbol for salvation. The Abrahamic covenant is the paradigm for the relationship that we are to have with God on an eternal level. The Torah of Moshe is not that type of covenant. The Torah of Moshe comes alongside the Abrahamic covenant and therefore enables the person to live righteously before God, thus making him or her a candidate for the continued and extending, ultimately the uh, uh, eternal, blessings that God affords covenant members. Let me just say it this way. The Abrahamic covenant is the paradigm for your salvation. The Mosaic covenant, by, by comparison, is the paradigm for your righteous living. If I want to use Christian parlance, the Abrahamic Covenant symbolizes justification, and the Mosaic Covenant symbolizes sanctification. So what we're reading about right now is mostly sanctification. God speaking to people who have already been, quote unquote, redeemed. They came out of Egypt, and that's the paradigm. So, keeping God's laws did not make the people God's treasured possession. The Hebrew is Am Segula. You remember God spoke these words over his people. I will make you my treasured possession. But keeping his ways was not the means of attaining covenant membership. Now, I'm speaking to the choir at this point in time. Most people listening to my commentary, whether you're Christian or Messianic, and I use the word Messianic meaning um, you're not still in standard Christian churches keeping Sunday, Christmas, Easter, etc., most of you listening to my commentary understand, of course, Ariel, I know that keeping the Torah does not save me. However, many people listening to my commentary get the impression that that seems to have been the first century dilemma facing the Judaisms that Paul encountered. I can tell you right now, that was not the primary problem facing the first century Judaisms. 
what was the primary problem facing the first century Judaisms? I'll get to a little later in my commentary, but for now, we need to understand that keeping God's laws was a way of, of maintaining covenant faithfulness with God. The Torah and the words contained therein were based on covenant faithfulness to Hashem. The words that are spoken are spoken to existing covenant members. Hear, O Israel, God says in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. God is the God of Israel. They, at this point in time, have already embraced God. They've already stood at the foot of Sinai, and they have collectively said all that you have said we will do. In other words, the marriage has taken place, and they are married to God. God is the husband. Israel is his bride. So God is speaking to his bride. He's speaking to existing covenant members. That's the paradigm that's being set by the context of the passages that we're reading. Okay? So the words that we're reading, they were based um, I'm sorry, the people that, that we're reading about, they were who they were based on the covenant faithfulness of God and the response of their hearts to that covenant faithfulness that we read about in Exodus chapter 19. They, the people who were listening to, comment, to, to, uh, listening to my commentary, listen to me, the people listening to Moshe's discourse, they were who they were based on the mercy and grace of the Father. Okay, It's identical to how it is today. The information I'm sharing with you is going to be found in many of the commentaries that I write that are available at this website. Like any good teacher, I understand that repetition is a very valuable tool, and it goes a long way in helping to establish the fundamental truths that we as believers need to have deep down with inside us as we read the words of God. In another study, I have stated it thusly, quote, for those who trust Hashem for the promises, the proper order for faith and obedience is set by the sequence in which the covenants were given. In other words, faith must precede obedience. But the kind of faith accepted by Hashem is one which naturally flows into obedience. True obedience never comes before faith, nor is it in addition to faith. Rather, it is always the result of true biblical faith. End quote. The footnote number one, if you look at the bottom of page two in my commentary, will show that I lifted that statement from Ariel and Devorah Berkowitz's book, Torah Rediscovered, and at the time that I quoted it, it came from FFOZ Publications in 1996 on page 32. Recently, Ariel Devora, Ariel, well, not Devora, but Ariel Berkowitz, and I have been in dialogue in email, and he's recently let me know that the book has been reprinted, republished, and uh, been updated by himself, and it's available through Shoreshim Productions. I believe it's S H O R E S H I M. Uh, go to Shoreshim.com, and um, you can uh, order the book there directly from the publication. Um, I don't have the book just yet. I'm still working on securing that. At any rate, at the top of page two in my commentary, um, what we need to understand concerning this statement that I just made about obedience and faith, this is an all-important truth, and it needs to be firmly rooted within our communities. I don't imagine that in the Messianic community that there are many people, Jew and Gentile alike, who are still struggling with the idea that supposedly the Torah can gain them right standing with God if they just walk into its commandments. There is a teaching, of course, within Christian circles that ostensibly Jewish people believe that if they walk out the Torah that God will somehow grant them salvation or he will favor them as a people. Now again, it is true that God, dem well, I was going to say demands, but God commands um, obedience to his words. But we fundamentally misunderstand covenantally why he wants us to walk into his ways. So once this all-important truth has been established, the, the relationship between faith and obedience, what do we do about relationship? After all, that is the central feature of covenants. God desires relationship, the relationship that was broken in the garden when man first disobeyed God's words. Shall we abolish the Torah now that we have been made righteous by faith? Is that what we should do? Again, the standard Christian theology of today seems, although not to say directly that the Torah needs to be booted completely, they seem to, to rather um, turn a deaf ear to the words that we're reading about here in the Torah. When God says, obey my words, the words that I gave to Israel, the, the modern church today 
says, well, I'm not Israel, so I guess these words don't apply to me. Or they say, no, I can't obey those because it's been done away with. It's been relaxed under Messiah. It's been, it's been superseded by the New Testament or something to that line. And so the question that I'm asking in my commentary here really is a rhetorical question. It's rhetorical because Paul also asked the same question. Shall we abolish the Torah now that we've been made righteous by faith? It's in the book of Romans. Heaven forbid! Paul would say, heaven forbid, and I say the same thing. Heaven forbid that we should abolish the Torah because of faith. No, what's Paul's answer, which is my answer? We do not abolish, but rather we establish Torah. Again, that's what Paul said to the believers at Rome. We do not abolish Torah in favor of faith. We establish the Torah because of the faith of Yeshua. Now in this commentary, I want to quote two particular passages at length. Uh, to let the Word of God speak for itself. It's always best, if you're going to have very, very fundamental concepts in your teachings, it's always best as a teacher to let God's Word be the foundation to form the basis of your further arguments. All right? I believe that this issue of obedience to the Torah is made clear by the very words which we read every week, if we would just stop and let the Spirit of God speak to us, we would be, be better off, okay? We will, will would do well to understand the important messages contained within these Torah portions, alright? I'm going to freely quote both what people call Old and New Covenant passages. In, in reality, I don't like the words Old and New. You, you know that by now. I'd, I prefer the term Tanakh and apostolic scriptures, or my, my good friend, Messianic minister, um, George Hunt of Roots of Messiah in Evergreen, Colorado, he likes the term um, latter ketuvim, the latter writings. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to quote both of these sections of scripture to show the unified message that salvation, that is to say being made righteous, is a gift freely given, and that once made righteous, Hashem desires that we become submissive to his righteous ways, in essence, to his Torah. So now let's turn in my commentary to um, some, some quotes that I've pulled, all right? These are quoted at length because of their importance. Now, Moshe states in no uncertain terms here in Deuteronomy, the effects of becoming and remaining obedient to the Torah, especially as it will impact their lives, the people's lives in the land. So let's read Devarim chapter 8 verses 1 through 10 out of the Pentateuch version. Quote, You must safeguard and keep the entire mandate that I am prescribing to you today. You will then survive, flourish, and come to occupy the land that God swore to your fathers. Remember the entire path along which God, your Lord, led you these 40 years in the desert. He sent hardships to test you, to determine what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He made life difficult for you, letting you go hungry, and then he fed you the manna which neither you nor your ancestors had ever experienced. This was to teach you that it is not by bread alone that man lives, but by all that comes out of God's mouth. The clothing you wore did not become tattered, and your feet did not become bruised these forty years. You must thus meditate on the fact that just as a man might chastise his child, so God your Lord is chastising you. Safeguard the commandments of God your Lord so that you will walk in his ways and remain in awe of him. God your Lord is bringing you to a good land, a, a, uh, a, land, flowing, a land with flowing streams and underground springs gushing out in valley and mountain. It is a land of wheat, barley, grapes, figs, and pomegranates, a land of olive oils and honey dates. It is a land where you will not eat rationed bread and you will not lack anything a land whose stones are iron and from whose mountains you will quarry copper. When you eat and are satisfied, you must therefore bless your Lord, uh, bless God your Lord for the good land that he has given you. End quote. Okay, after reading the verses now, you heard what Moshe said to Israel concerning keeping the commandments. Look down again at verse 6. Safeguard the commandments of God your Lord so that you will walk in his ways and remain in all of you. And then after that, the next set of verses talk about how um, that, that uh, you know God's bringing you to a good land with all these blessings. So you listen to what the Torah is teaching. And I am quite at a loss of understanding as to how anyone could misconstrue the intent of the promises here. 
clearly these are words of blessing based on obedience, right? God says you obey, and I will bless you. Clearly God is rewarding obedience. Moreover, these verses do not spell out the terms of salvation for an individual based on such obedience. Go back and look at the passage again. Do you see anything there about salvation? I don't see anything there about salvation. No, they speak to the well-being of a member of God's family once he has already, uh, once he has already become a member. Um, you may remember, uh, uh, Torah obedience doesn't bring about the membership that Moshe is talking about. Uh, Torah obedience brings out... Um, the blessing that God intends for those who are already existing covenant members. The Torah is meant to be walked out by what? By existing covenant members. And God, for his part, will bless existing covenant members for their maintenance or their maintaining of covenant faithfulness. So we see the Torah is given to a group of covenant members. The paradigm again was set at the foot of Sinai in Exodus chapter 19 and 20 when the Devarim, the ten words, uh, and the covenant was made with the people and their response to God was, all that you have said we will do. These were people who were former slaves. They've now been set free from, from slavery. Uh, they are no longer in Egypt. They are out of Egypt. And of course the paradigm in the scriptures for Egypt is a type and shadow of sin. So we see people that we've got to understand that the Torah doesn't save anyone. God never designed uh, obedience to the Torah to be um, sort of some sort of entry marker into either the covenant or set the, uh, um, the type and shadow for salvation. It just doesn't work that way. What brings about confusion, uh, especially in today's Christian circles, is the oft-forgotten idea that the Torah speaks about Forensic righteousness, which, of course, is the kind we inherit from God's gracious, gracious provision. In essence, Messiah, Yeshua. Uh, forensic righteousness is spoken of in Christian circles as justification. Okay, Forensic means by the books or, or a legal righteousness. Um, it is the kind that we inherit once we place our faith in Jesus. Um, so the Torah speaks about forensic righteousness, and it also speaks about behavioral righteousness. There are two types, at least these two. I'm sure there might be, even be more aspects to it, but for my, for my teaching purpose, I just want to single out these two, these two sides of one coin. Forensic righteousness on one side, behavioral righteousness on the other side, and of course behavioral righteousness is what Christian, uh, Christian uh, pastors call uh, um, sanctification, okay? Right living. Um, and, and again, once we understand that the Torah it comes alongside of the Abrahamic covenant, um, the Mosaic covenant, I should say, comes alongside the Mosaic covenant. Let's try that again. The Mosaic covenant comes alongside the Abrahamic covenant. Once we understand the relationship between these two documents or these two covenants, as it were, then we will begin to see the partner relationship uh, between them as is explained in the justification and the sanctification process, respectively. So, um, behavioral righteousness is gained by becoming what? submissive to the Torah of Hashem. Now, because of our new life in Messiah, speaking to believers now, because of our new life in Messiah, we have already inherited the holiness that Hashem intended for us to possess all along. Remember, when God invests in a person, when God invested His Son in you, when God invested His Spirit in you, well then God set a plan into motion, a good plan, a godly plan for your life. We often speak of this in terms of a call on our life, right? God does not just save us and then just leave us in our junk, just leave us in our mess. Many of us who, were, who have come to know Jesus um, came out of a life of difficulty, perhaps a life of drunkenness, a life of, of drug use, a life of, of abuse, uh, a life of, of, of gangs, a life of, of whatever, a brokenness. Jesus comes in. And he does set us free from the inside. But that's really just the beginning of living for God. Because from that moment forward, we must avail ourselves of the Spirit's power within us and the words of God on the outside to begin cleaning our life up. And it becomes a partner effort. 
Okay, let me read my commentary and you'll begin to see how this makes sense. Again, because of the new life that we have in Messiah, we are already holy from the inside out. There's nothing more we need to do once we have surrendered our lives to, to Messiah. Okay, God intends for us to sit in heavenly places with His Son. And He does this by regeneration from the inside out. Paul talks about uh, in Romans 12 that the mind needs to be regenerated. And uh, so the, the, the process starts by inviting Jesus into your life. But when we place our faith, or I really say in my commentary, our trusting faithfulness in Yeshua, the perfect man of God, then what happens is our holiness, or in some cases our lack of holiness, it actually becomes the holiness of the Father. You see how that works? Again, I'm, I'm speaking to the choir here. Um, we take on the the character of the Son. The mind that was in Messiah is the mind that we are to take on. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, the Bible tells us. We are to have the mind of Christ. We are to have the mind of Messiah. In appropriating this new identity, the Father, when He looks at us, He, none, he doesn't see the sinner. He sees the saint. We have been transformed by the death of Messiah and the resurrection of Messiah. Therefore, we are new, crea uh, new creatures, we're new creations, we're new from the inside out. The outside may take a little while to ally itself or align itself with the truth of the inside. In other words, old habits die hard and the old flesh needs to be crucified daily. That's a daily process. But from the inside, the change takes place when the Spirit takes up residence within us. What happens is, is our constitution changes, and we are no longer deemed unholy. That's, that is, there's your legal status change right there. We are no longer unholy because of His riches and glory, because of Yeshua's riches. And of course, this includes His holy standard of being. There's nothing unholy about Yeshua, wouldn't you agree? Of course you do. So if the mind of Messiah is in me, then I must understand that I have to put off unholiness. And this includes my lifestyle. Okay, God takes the righteousness of Yeshua and transfers his righteousness forensically to me. And so I also become righteous because of Yeshua. It's not a righteousness that I earn by, by some form of identity or by any self-effort. No, no, no. It is because of what Jesus has done for me. It's a gift that I accept. God opens my eyes, and I, I accept this free gift of salvation. Yeshua comes into me. The Spirit takes up residence within me, and thus I am a new person. I, the old has died, the new has come to life, and there's where we get the term born again. So, we understand this. Again, I'm speaking to the choir. How this bears uh, uh, um, importance to, to Torah observance is where I'm going, all right? But, bef but before we can begin to understand how the Torah works in our lives, we have to first grasp this central truth and begin to live according to it, all right? Let me say this next statement and just let it sink in. We are holy because Yeshua has made us holy. We are holy because He has made us holy. There's nothing we can do to earn His holiness. Now again, some of you are saying, Ariel, keep going. Keep going with it. I understand that part. Where are you going with this? All right. Listen up. Just as unrighteous Avraham in Genesis became righteous when he placed his complete faith in Hashem, so too we inherit the righteousness and holiness of the Holy One when we place our unreserved trust in His Son. Okay? That part we know. That part, that first part I just mentioned, that clause, that, that sentence, is so well known in Christian circles that I do not need to repeat it. However, this next step is the part where things get muddy in your average Christian setting. As a side note, I might add that very first clause is the part that many Jews fail to grasp. Okay, They don't understand that righteousness is granted through God's provision, through God's gift of His Son. And as a result of their misunderstanding of this forensic righteousness, many Jewish people are missing out 
on all that God has for them. Sure, they're living according to the Torah as best they know how. But until the Spirit takes up residence within them, as I mentioned earlier, their Torah observance is only going to be so much intellectual nutrition. It's only going to be so much self-service. Only by trusting in God's son, uh, sent one, the Son of God, Yeshua the Messiah, only by accepting Him by faith will they be able to properly walk out the Torah the way that God intended it. Okay, so we understand how we get saved. We understand how we become holy from the inside. But the challenge I want to present to you today is that holiness is also a duty. That's right. What do I mean? Well, before I explain what I mean, let's go ahead and call this part A to the commentary. And when we return, we'll be at the bottom of page 3, and we'll talk about what I mean uh, as far as holiness being a duty. Okay? Stay tuned.